Church by the Glades. How we doing this morning? Is anybody glad to be at church right about now? Can you make some noise? I just wanted to know who came ready. For those who that may not know who I am, my name is Pastor Charlie Hughes. I have the honor and the privilege of leading the young adult movement of Church by the Glades called Rally. I got some Rally young adults sitting up here with me. They're going to help me preach a little bit this morning. And um, you guys are a good looking crew. This might be the, the best looking service I preached to all weekend. Look to the person who's sitting next to and tell them like you mean it, you look good this morning. Oh, you look good. You got your Sunday best outfit together, your hair is did, your makeup's done, you look good. You guys look good too. Now look to the other person you're sitting next to, your obvious second choice for whatever reason, and tell them, you must work out. Oh, you must work out. You're strong, you're fit, you're muscular, you're in shape. Some of you are laughing way too hard right now. So let's say it's like any other day, it's early in the morning, you walk into your local gym, you got music playing in your ears, there's people throwing weight around all around you, you're feeling the energy, you're catching a vibe, so you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to bench press today. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So you get underneath the bar, you do a few warm-up sets, and you're feeling good, you're, you're feeling fresh. So you think to yourself once again, even though I'm working out by myself this morning, I'm going to go for a PR today. I'm going to attempt to lift more weight than I ever have before in a single rep. I'm going to hit a max. So you load more weight on the bar. You turn the music up in your ears. You do the best you can to hype yourself up before you make personal history. And when you finally lift that bar up off the rack, you think to yourself, this feels a little bit heavier than I thought it would. As you begin to lower the bar towards your chest, it falls much faster than you anticipated. And when the, when the time finally comes for you to push that bar up off your chest, it won't give. It won't move. It won't budge. You are stuck. You're still. You're stagnant. You're hopeless. You're helpless. You're hurting. You are in trouble. You are in very serious danger. And because you're working out by yourself, you have no one to call out to and ask for help. This morning, I want to talk about the importance of having people in your life who are there for you. I want to talk about the importance of having people in your life who got your back. I want to talk about the importance of having people in your life to give you the help you need when you need it most. The title of this sermon is, Can I Get a Spot? <laughs> now I'm out of breath. I believe that in order for us to become the versions of ourselves that God has created and called us to be, we need a select trusted few people in our lives that know us on deep, personal, and vulnerable levels. Matthew chapter 17 is our primary text this morning. And we're just going to read nine verses, verses one through nine. They read this. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a mountain by themselves. There he was, here's a big word, transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The event we just witnessed take place in this passage of Scripture is what biblical scholars like yourself call the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. 
See, up to this point, the 12 disciples of Jesus knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were not aware that Jesus was God. In the Jewish tradition, the Messiah was believed to be a deliverer sent by God to emancipate the Jewish people from oppression, but the Messiah was not necessarily believed to be God himself. So by Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, his three closest friends and most trusted disciples on this mountaintop and to to transfigure in front of them into his heavenly form. This was Jesus making a solidifying statement of his sovereignty and a declaration of his divinity, essentially saying, not only am I your deliverer, but I am divine. But notice how Jesus chose to do this. Jesus had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 disciples. He left nine of them behind, and he took a select trusted three on this mountaintop to transfigure in front of and be totally transparent with. If this tells me anything, this tells me this. We should be honest with all, but only transparent with a few. How many know not everyone needs to be all up in your business? (laughs) Not everyone needs to know everything about you. Not everybody has to be your best friend, and that's okay. But at the same time, by transfiguring on this mountaintop in front of Peter, James, and John, I think Jesus is setting an example for us. And I think Jesus is painting a picture for us of how important, of how vital, of how crucial it is for us to have people in our lives who know us on deep, personal, vulnerable, intimate, and dare I say uncomfortable levels. You and I, as human beings... We are created for community. We have been created, wired for connection with other human beings. God makes this very clear in the book of Genesis when he says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. It's very important that you hear me and understand that in the Christian faith, we worship and serve a triune God. One God made up of three unique persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who have lived in relationship with each other for all of eternity past. Because the triune God exists in community and we were created in the image and likeness of God, this means that we have been created to exist in community. We were made by God in his image to be relational beings. We were designed by God to know others and be made known by others, which means you cannot become the version of yourself that God has created and called you to be unless you have a select, trusted few people in your life who know you on deep, personal levels to draw out of you what God has placed within you so you can accomplish the plan that God has for you. (laughs) Practically speaking, You need people in your life who love you and will hear you out and hold you accountable. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. But the thing is, how am I supposed to carry your burdens And how are you supposed to carry my burdens unless we let each other know what it is, what we need help carrying? You cannot receive a spot until you request a spot. For this reason, you need a select trusted few people in your life who will hear you out through. Here comes a big and scary word. Confession. Scripture says this about confession. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confession is something that God commands. 
God does not command us to confess, to hurt us, embarrass us, or cause us to relive the pain of our past mistakes and traumas. No, God commands us to confess so we can experience and receive healing and breakthrough that we can never find in ourselves or on our own. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. Read the highlighted word with me. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's, it's a purification thing. So maybe you should view confession as a detox for your soul. Confession is not meant to put shame on you. Confession is meant by God to be a means through which he can take sin away from you and gift grace to you. But if confession is so great, if it's so good for us, if it's so beneficial, then how come we can be so slow, so reluctant, so, so hesitant to confess? I think the answer is pretty simple. We fear the consequences of confession. We fear how life may change if we engage in confession. We fear that if we confess, we will be rejected. That if people knew who we really were, the things we've done, the mistakes we've made, the problems we've caused, they would want nothing to do with us. When the truth is, no one is perfect. Scripture says, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. In God's eyes, from God's vantage point, sin is sin. No sin is worse than another. All sin deserves and earns the exact same punishment. In other words, at the foot of the cross is level ground. So no matter what your secret sin may be, and no matter what your past may look like, does not make you any uglier or unworthy or undeserving of love and acceptance and grace and forgiveness from your heavenly father than the next person is. Obviously, Jesus being God and being perfect means that Jesus had no secret sin in his life or trauma in his past or insecurity that he needed to confess to. But I would argue that by taking Peter, James, and John on this mountaintop and transfiguring in front of them, this was the closest Jesus ever got to confession. Jesus gave these three trusted friends of his an intimate look at the fullness of who he was. So that way they might know how to best support him moving forward. This was true transparency and vulnerability in its purest form. And you remember how Peter, James, and John responded to Jesus being vulnerable through his confession to them? They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay in this intimate moment with Jesus forever. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up tents for you, Moses and Elijah, me, James, and John. We'll sleep on the ground. We just want to stay in this intimate moment with you for life. Scripture says that you, my friend, are fearfully and wonderfully made. So when you confess to sin, insecurity, pain, and shame in your life and in your past, what you're doing is you are removing things from your life that have been covering the beauty and the power that God has placed within you. So when you confess to the right people, they won't scream, flee, or run away in horror. No, they'll begin to love you deeper as a result of knowing you better. Psychologist Brene Brown says it this way, that vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. If someone leaves you as a result of what you confess to them, your problem is not as much what you confess to as it is who you confess to. 
That's a them problem, not so much a you problem. I also think sometimes we can be slow to confess out of fear that confessing to a particular sin, shame, pain, or insecurity is what will make our problems quote unquote real. Hear me. Confession is not what makes your problems reality. Confession is what makes healing a possibility. Confession is not what makes your problems real. Your problems are real whether you choose to recognize them or not. Confession is not what makes your problems real, but not confessing is what makes you in denial. Confession is not what makes your problems real, but repentance is what will make your problems your past. You need a select, trust a few people in your life, Church by the Glades, who will hold you accountable in your repentance. Repentance is what gives us a new definition and a new direction. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that all who confess and repent of their sins are new creations in Christ Jesus. You have a new definition found in being a new creation. Now let's talk about your new direction. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. In the New Testament, in the original Greek, the word for repent means to have another mind. It is the equivalent to the Old Testament word in Hebrew for turn. Watch this. To repent is a literal turning. It is a turning of beliefs. It is a turning of habits. It is a turning of decisions. It is a turning from toxic environments you frequent. It is a turning from dangerous people you surround yourself with. It is a turning from dysfunctional distractions. It is a turning from self-destructive coping mechanisms. It is a turning of every aspect and area and part of your life that has kept you living in sin and from living in relationship with your Savior. As we all know, Humans are creatures of habit. But if in Christ Jesus you are a new creation, then this means you have no other choice. You have no other option. You cannot live as you once did. You must turn from your sin. You must turn from temptation. You must turn from wickedness. You must turn from evil. And you must turn to God. Repentance is what makes our confession complete and our apology authentic. Repentance or confession without repentance is similar to saying, I just found out I have a life-threatening illness, but I refuse any type of treatment or medical attention. What's the point of recognizing your condition if you're not willing to take any steps towards healing? <laughs> repentance is what gives you the freedom to start fresh and license to heal. Maybe you should view repentance as your very own reputation rehab. Scripture says in the book of Revelation that we overcome our accuser, our enemy, the devil, who tries to deceive us into believing that we're nothing more than our past and our worst mistakes. That we overcome this accuser by the blood of the lamb being the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. And by the word by the power of our testimony. Hold up, hold up, hold up. If repentance is what makes my problems my past, and the book of Revelation tells me that there is power in my testimony, meaning there is power in my past. Is anybody tracking me with me? This means that repentance is what transforms, or how about this language, is what turns my greatest sources of shame, my worst pains, and my biggest problems into my greatest sources of power. So every time I repent, I receive power. Every time I repent, I receive fuel from my faith. Every time I repent, I receive ammunition from my trust in God. 
oh, this is just great. This means that every time the devil tries to remind me of my past, he's reminding me of the power I have to defeat him with. So go ahead, devil. Keep reminding me of my past. Keep reminding me of how I survived. Keep reminding me of how God didn't give up on me. Keep reminding me of how God didn't quit on me. Keep reminding me of how God came through for me. Oh, I wish somebody in this place would help me praise God. It's time for some reputation rehab up in here. Remember where you were. Remember where you started. And thank God for how far he's brought you through your repentance. The old is gone and the new has come. You once were lost and now you're found. You once were hurting and now you're healed. Somebody thank God in this place. But how many know, even after coming so far, there can still be a temptation to turn back? Oftentimes, after people give their life to Jesus and initially repent of their sin, they'll say something like, I'm making a 360. <laughs> a 360 degree change of direction. A 360 degree turn in my life. Not to confuse your theology with your geometry but you don't want to make a 360. Because if you make a 360, this means you end up right back where you started. What you want to do is you want to make a 180. But sadly, too often, what ends up happening is people do end up making 360s because they could not resist the temptation to turn back. The temptation to turn back is a real thing. And it's hardest to resist when for whatever reason, God chooses not to replace as fast as you chose to repent. Like you repented, you turn from your sin as fast as you could and as best as you knew how by cutting certain people, places, activities, and environments out of your life that were leading you to making poor decisions. But for whatever reason, God has chose to not immediately bring new people, new places, new activities, and new environments into your lives to replace the old ones you got rid of. So you feel tempted to turn back. Maybe in your life, after cutting certain people in places out of your life, you're now lonely and confused and the temptation to turn back looking sounds like a temptation to turn up, to go out partying, hit the clubs, the bars every weekend like you once did. Maybe the temptation to turn back in your life looks and sounds like a temptation to pick up that 2 a.m. phone call from your ex, and you know what they're going to ask for before you ever even say hello. It wouldn't be temptation if it wasn't hard to resist. But at the end of the day, we have to decide if we are people who believe what God's word says is true. A verse that I've clung on to the majority of this last year as I've waited for God to replace, and I still am waiting on God to replace certain things in my life that I repented from that were just keeping me from trusting him wholeheartedly. It's this verse I haven't memorized, but I highlighted a few words for you to read with me. Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord withholds no good thing from those who walk with integrity. The Lord withholds no good thing from those who walk with integrity. What I get from this verse, what I get from this truth is that if I am walking with integrity... And if God is not withholding, then God's slowness to replace what I've repented from must mean that he is working. If he's not withholding, he must be working. Working on what? I don't know. Maybe he's working on me. Maybe he's working on what he's getting ready to give me. But either way, he is working. If he's not withholding, 
he's working. If he's not withholding, he's working. If he's not withholding, he's working. If he's not withholding, he's working. If he's not withholding, he's working. And I do not have to be worried. I don't have to turn back. I don't have to make a 360. I can stop at a 180. And I can trust that in God's perfect timing, he will do what Romans 8.28 says, and he will turn my situation for my good and for his glory. Church, by the grace, what I'm trying to get through your mind this morning is that spirituality is a lot like strength training. Just like working out, not only is repentance and confession a daily decision, it's a destiny decision. Just as your muscles must be broken down before they can be built, be built back up, oftentimes God has to break us down before he can build us up. God has to break through your fear before he can build up your faith. God has to break through your stubbornness before he can build up your strength. God has to break through your pessimism before he can build up your perseverance. For this reason, you need people in your life who will hold you accountable in your repentance. You need a select, trusted few spiritual workout partners. My, my friend Dave is actually here. I'm going to invite him on the stage right now. Dave is my workout partner. One day when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to look like Dave in heaven. Dave's in phenomenal shape. We work out, I mean, on a bad week, probably twice a week. But he is, he's a beast. But Dave knows, he's a certified personal trainer. So if you're looking for that, you can hit him up afterwards. Um, but Dave knows that sometimes when I'm tired, I can have a tendency to take it easy on myself. He, he knows that, that this is how I can get. So I know what 135 feels like on the incline bench, and I know what 155 feels like on the incline bench. And on the days when I'm tired, and I feel like doing 135, but Dave knows I'm capable of doing 155, Dave will push me to do the extra weight. He will push me to do the extra reps. He will push me to go the extra mile. As the executive pastor of this church, Raul Palacios says, the difference between those who do what is ordinary and extraordinary is just a little bit extra. You need people in your life who will push you to do the little bit extra. You need people who will push you to confess. People who will push you to repent. Let's go. People who will push you to read your Bible. People come who will push you to come to church. People who will push you to join a life group. People who will push you. But on the days when maybe I didn't get a good night's sleep or I forgot to drink some caffeine and I'm really tired, they have known I really like to take it easy on myself. And these are the days when I need Dave to spot me, to literally lift the weight with me, to assist me in my ascension, to support me in my struggle, to help me through my hard work. There are going to be times in your life when you feel so beat down, you're not going to know how to take another step. And this is when you need your spiritual workout partners to spot you by coming alongside of you and saying, not only do I believe in you, but I'm going to start believing with you. Not only am I praying for you, but I'm going to start praying with you. I'm going to come alongside you. You don't have to walk through life by yourself. Let's join a life group together. Let's start singing together at church. Let me be there for you. Let me assist you. Let me support you. Let me help you. Let me spot you. Let me make the weight of life just a little bit easier for you by giving you a spot. Connection is crucial. Commitment is best kept. And change is best maintained in the context of community. There is no shame in needing a spot. There is no shame in needing a spot. There is no shame in needing a spot. And finally, because I'm a sinner in need of a savior, there might be a few days when I miss going to the gym or I let my diet slip. And this is when I need my workout partner, Dave, to, to confront me 
to, uh, to say things to me like, Charlie, where you been? Where, where you been? You're looking kind of soft. You're looking kind of skinny fat. Any fellow skinny fat people in the room? I literally give this man permission to bully me until I get my butt back in the gym. You need people in your life who know that they have permission to hold you accountable in your repentance by calling you out on your you know what. People who will not think twice about confronting you if your 180 starts to turn into a 210 because you are slowly but surely reverting back to your old sinful ways. People who will say things to you like, where you been the last few weeks at church? Why haven't you been in our last few life groups? You haven't been posting on our YouVersion Bible app. Have you been in the Word? I've seen you hanging out with that guy. I've seen you hanging out with that girl. I thought you were done with them. What's that all about? I've seen you posting at certain late night spots that you told me you needed to take a break from. Have you been making good decisions? And it's so important we remember that when these people who love us confront us, it's not just them calling us out. It's them calling us higher calling us to a higher standard of living and following Jesus that they know and in our heart of hearts we know we're capable of. Make some noise for my buddy Dave. Thank you, Dave. But how is someone supposed to be the type of friend to you that knows they have the freedom and permission to push you, spot you, and confront you if they don't know you. I know being vulnerable by confessing to sin, insecurity, pain, and shame in your life is difficult. I know this is hard. I know this is uncomfortable. But not only is confession necessary for you to receive forgiveness from your Heavenly Father, confession is necessary for you to build these types of life-giving and God-honoring relationships that you desperately need. If you choose to live life without giving a trusted few full access to all of who you are, I'm telling you, you will not make it. Because there will be a time in your life when you'll want to quit and you will have no one to speak life and encouragement to you when you need it most. You will be tempted to quit on your calling. You will be tempted to quit on your marriage. You will be tempted to quit on your purity. You will be tempted to quit on your sobriety. You will be tempted to quit on your faith. You may even be tempted to give up on life itself. I'm not going to assume in a room this big and with a crowd this size that everyone under the sound of my voice is doing perfectly fine. There might be someone here that just by showing up to church this morning, you're making your last cry for help. Because you've been contemplating suicide all week. And you came to church just to get out of the house because you're afraid of what you do to yourself and you spent another minute by yourself. If you live this life without letting others know you, I'm telling you, one day when it's too late, there are going to be people you leave behind who will be saying to themselves, if only I would have known. If only I would have known how anxious they were, I would have been the type of friend who loved them enough to remind them of who they were and how far they had come. So that way they might have had the strength and faith to keep moving forward. If only I would have known what kind of adversity they were facing, I would have been the kind of friend who loved them enough to be loyal to them, to fight for them by defending them when lies were told and when rumors were spread. I would have stuck by their side through thick and thin, through hell and high water, through no matter what trouble may have come their way because we would have established a trust built on transparency that would have been tougher than any trouble. I would have stuck by their side because I would have known what was in their heart. And I'm not quite sure how it works one day when we die, but I just wonder if one day, hopefully many years, hopefully many years now, when you die and go to heaven, if when you get there, if God shows you all you could have been and all you could have had, if you would have let a select trust of you know you on deeper than a surface level, if you'll be saying to yourself, if only I would have known, if only I would have known the happiness I could have had, the peace I could have possessed, the strength I could have seized, if I would have let a select trust of you know me in such a way I would have kept believing. I would have kept trusting. I would have kept obeying. I, I would have kept praising. I would have kept praying. I would have kept showing up. I would have kept taking the steps. I would not have quit. I would not have given in. I would not have given up. I would not have let my standards drop. 
my friend, the good news I have for you this morning is that you know now. Now you know. And it's not over until it's over. You still have the opportunity. You still have the chance. You still have the time. You still have the time to confess. You still have the time to repent. You still have the time to find people who will hear you out. To find people who will hold you accountable. To find people who will push you. To find people who will spot you. To find people who will confront you. To find people who will help you unlock your purpose. To find people who will help you unleash your potential. To find people who would love to help become the version of yourself that God's created and called you to be. Is there anybody in this place in need of a friend? Raise your hand. Wave it at me. I just want to know who I've been talking to. Peter, where you at? John, where you at? James, where you at? What do you see my select trusted view? Let's get together and change the world. Somebody make some noise for Jesus. You know where your select trust if you are, they're here. They're to your left, they're to your right, they're in front of you, they're behind you. Here at Church by the Glaze, we offer something called life groups. They're what help a big church feel small. That is where you will meet your select trust if you. Do not leave campus today if you have not yet signed up for a life group. After I pray, you better run through those double doors to my right, to your left. Go to Best Next Step. Sign up for a group. Your select trust if you are waiting for you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every single person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray, Lord, that right now you would give them the, the bravery and the boldness to sign up for a group. God, I pray, Lord, that as they would get out of their comfort zone and their search for community, that God, you would bring the right people to them and they would live the life that you've always wanted them to live because of it. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray together. Amen.